Chapter Five of the Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon. The Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Ballou. Chapter Five. The Naval Officer. The reader will think that Seven League Boots, the storyteller's prerogative, are in special demand as it regards our story, for once more we must return through a period of years to the date or thereabouts on which our story opens. It was on one of those closed, sultry afternoons that characterized the climate of summer in India that two of our characters were seated together in a graceful and rather elegant villa in the environs of Calcutta. The air of the lady, for the couple were of either sex, was one of beauty and repose. She was evidently listening to the gallant speech of her companion with respect, but without interest, while on his part the most casual observer might have read in his voice, his features, and his words, the accent, the bearing, the language of love. The lady was a gentle being of surpassing beauty, with black eyes, jetty hair, and brilliant complexion. There was little of the characteristics of the East in her appearance, though she seemed to be quite at home beneath the Indian sun. She was of the middle height, perhaps a little too slender and delicate in form to meet a painter's idea of perfection, but yet just such an idol as a poet would have worshipped. She was strikingly handsome, and there was a brilliancy and spirit in the glance of her dark eyes that told of much character and much depth of feeling and while you gazed at her now, sitting beneath the broad piazza, you would have detected a shadow ever and anon across her brow, as though the words of him by her side aroused some unpleasant memory, and diverted her thoughts rather to past scenes than to the consideration of his immediate remarks. The gentleman, who seemed to be pleading an unsuccessful suit, wore the undress uniform of the English Navy, and in the outer harbor, in view of the very spot where they sat, there rode a sloop of war with St. George's Cross floating at her peak. The officer was young, but bore the insignia of his rank upon his person, which showed him to be the captain of yonder proud vessel. He might have been five or six and twenty, but scarcely more, and bore about him those unmistakable tokens of gentle birth which will shine through the coarsest as well as the finest attire. The lady was not regarding him now. Her eyes were bent on the distant sea, but still he pleaded, still urged in gentle tones the suit he brought. I see Miss Huntington has some more favored swain on whom to bestow her favors, but I am sure that she has no truer friend or more ardent admirer. You are altogether mistaken in your premises, she said coolly, as she tossed her fragrant fan of sandalwood, perfuming the soft atmosphere about them. A subject who sues for a favor at court, Miss Huntington, if he is unsuccessful, thinks himself at least entitled to know the reason why he is denied. But suppose the court declines to give him a reason, said the lady, still coolly. Its decision admits of no appeal, I must acknowledge, replied her suitor. Then reason I have none, Captain, and so pray let that suffice. But Miss Huntington, surely— "'Nay, Captain,' she said at last, weary of his importunity, "'you know well my feelings. "'Far be it for me to play for one moment the coquette's part. "'I thank you for the compliment you pay me by these assurances, "'but you are fully aware that I can never encourage a suit "'that finds no response in my heart. "'I trust that no word or act of mine has ever deceived you for one moment. "'No, Miss Huntington, you have ever been thus cold and impassive towards me.' ever turning a deaf ear to my prayer. Why, why can you not love me? Nay, Captain, we will not enter into particulars. It is needless, it is worse than needless, and a matter that is exceedingly unpleasant to me. I must earnestly beg, sir, that you will not again refer to this subject under any circumstance. Your commands are law to me, Miss Huntington, answered the discomfited lover, as he rose from the seat he had occupied by her side and turned partially away. It was well he did so, for had she seen the demoniac expression of his countenance as he struggled to control the vehemence of his feelings, she would have feared that he might do either her or himself violence. 
May I not hope that years of fond attachment, years of continued assiduity, may yet outweigh your indifference, Miss Huntington? he said earnestly. Indeed, indeed, no. You do but pain me by this countenance of a subject that— Ah, mother, she said, interrupting herself, I have been looking at the captain's ship yonder. Is she not a noble craft? and how daintily she floats upon the waters. A ship is always a beautiful sight, my child, and especially so when she bears the flag that we see flaunting gracefully from that vessel. When do you sail, Captain? asked Mrs. Huntington, who had just joined her daughter on the piazza, and did not observe the officer's confusion. The ship rides by a single anchor, madam, and only waits her commander, he replied rather mechanically than otherwise, as he turned his glance seaward. "'So soon? I'd hoped you were to favor us with a longer stay,' said the mother. The officer looked towards the daughter, as though he wished it had been her that had expressed such a desire. But she still gazed at the distant ship, and he saw no change in her handsome features. "'We officers are not masters of our own time, madam, and can rarely consult our own wishes as to a cruising ground.' but I frankly own that it was something more than mere accident which brought me this time to Calcutta. As he said this, his eyes again wandered towards her daughter's face, but it was still cold, impassive and beautiful as before, while she gazed on that distant sea. He paused for a moment more, almost trembling with suppressed emotions of disappointment, chagrin and anger, and seemed at a loss what to say further. He felt constrained, and wished that he might have seen the daughter for a moment more alone. "'Farewell is an unpleasant word to say, ladies,' he said at last, still controlling his feelings with a masterly effort. Then offering a hand to the mother, he bowed respectfully and said, "Goodbye," and to her, who now turned with evident feeling evinced in her lovely face at the idea of a long parting, he offered his hand, which was frankly pressed, while he said, I carry away a heavy heart to see with me, Miss Huntington. Could it be weighed, it would overballast yonder ship. Farewell, Captain. A happy and safe voyage to you, she answered, with assumed gaiety of tone, but there was no reply. He bowed low and hastened away, with a spirit of disappointment clouding his sunburned features. The view which might be had from the window commanded a continuous sight of the road that the young officer must traverse to reach the ship, and though she had treated him thus coldly, and had so decidedly declined his suit, yet here lingered some strange interest about him in her mind, as was evinced by her now repairing to the window, and sitting behind the broad shadow of its painted screen, where she watched his approach to the landing, near the city gates, and saw the sturdy boatmen dip their oars in regular time, propelling the boat with arrow-like speed to the ship's side where its master hastened upon deck and disappeared, while the boat was hoisted to the quarter davits. Anon she saw the sheets fall from the ponderous yards, and sheeted home, the anchor gradually raised to her bow, the yard squared to bring her with her head to the sea, and then a clear white cloud of smoke burst from her bows as she gathered steerage way, and a dull heavy report of distant ordnance boomed upon the ear of the listening girl unanswered by a deep sigh from her own bosom, a sigh not for him who had just left her, but for some kindred association that his presence aroused. The villa where we have introduced the reader was that of the late Edward Huntington, a successful English merchant, who had resided many years in India and had realized a fortune, which he had proposed to return to his native land to enjoy with his wife and only child but death had stepped in to put an abrupt end to his hopes, and to render abortive all his well-arranged plans, some twelve months previous to the period of which we have spoken. Mrs. Huntington, the widow, had remained in Calcutta to settle up her husband's affairs, and this done, she determined to embark at once with her daughter for England, where her relatives, friends, and early associations were all located. Miss Huntington, as the reader may have gathered, was no coquette, her great beauty and real loveliness of character had challenged the admiration of many a rich grandee and many an eminent character among her own countrymen in this distant land. But no one had seemed to make the least impression upon her heart, 
the gayest and wittiest found in her one quite their equal the thoughtful and pathetic were equally at home by her side but her heart to them seemed encased in iron so cold and immovable it continued to all the assaults that gallantry made against its fastness and yet no one who knew her really doubted the tenderness of her feelings and the sensibility of her heart her beauty was quite matured that is she must have numbered at least twenty years but there was still a girlish loveliness a childlike parody and sincerity in all she said and did that showed the real freshness of her heart and innocence of her mind far too pure and good and gentle was she for him who had so earnestly sued for her hand as we have seen beneath a gentlemanly exterior that other whom we have seen depart from her side under such peculiar circumstances hid a spirit of petty meanness and violence of temper a soul that hardly merited the name and which made him enemies everywhere friends nowhere robert bramble for this was he the same whom the reader has seen as a boy at home in bramble park had not improved in spirit or manliness by advance in years the declining pecuniary fortune of his father's house to which we have before alluded had led him early to seek employment in the navy and by dint of influence and attention to his profession he had gradually risen to the position in which we have found him as a commander in her majesty's service on the india station that he loved the widow's daughter was true that is to say as sincerely as he was capable of loving any one but his soul was too selfish to entertain true love for another the same spirit that had led him to the petty oppressions and the ceaseless annoyances which he had exercised towards his younger brother in childhood still actuated him and there was not a gleam of that chivalric spirit which his profession usually inspires in those who adopt it as a calling shining within the recesses of his breast entirely unlike miss huntington in every particular we have yet seen that he exercised some singular power over her that is so far as to really interest her beyond even a degree that she was willing to exhibit before him what and why this was so must more clearly appear in the course of the story as it progresses mrs huntington was a lady of polished manner and cultivated intellect belonging to what might be termed the old school of english gentlewomen she had reared her only child with jealous care and assiduous attention so that her mind had been richly stored in classic lore and her hands duly instructed in domestic duties there was no mock modesty about the mother she was straightforward and literal in all she said or did evidently of excellent family she was sufficiently assured of her position not to be sensitive about its recognition by others and preferred to instill into her daughter's mind sound wholesome principles to useless and giddy accomplishments and yet the daughter was accomplished an excellent musician upon the piano and harp and a vocalist of rare sweetness and perfection of execution as well as mistress of other usual studies of her sex but the idea we would convey is that the mother had rather endeavored to fill her child's mind with real information and knowledge than to teach her that the chief end and aim of life was to learn how to captivate a husband she preferred to make her daughter a true and noble-hearted woman possessed of intrinsic excellence rather than to make her marketable for matrimonial sale to give her something that would prove to her under any and all circumstances a reliance viz sound principles and an excellent education mother how long before we shall turn our face towards england said the daughter soon after the scene which we have described of the sailing ship and her commander within the month i hope my child i have already directed the solicitor to close up all his business relative to your father's estate and the next homeward-bound ship may bear us in it i shall feel sad to leave our peaceful home here mother for save my dear father's death has been very pleasant very happy to be here there are many dear associates that must ever hang about its memory my dear but after all we shall be returning to our native land and that is a sweet thought it is some twelve years since we lost sight of english soil i remember it most vividly said the child recalling the past ay as though it were but yesterday that night as she lay sleeping in her daintily furnished apartment 
into which the soft night air was admitted through sweet geranium and mignonette, which bloomed and shed their perfume with rare sweetness, she dreamed of her native land, of him who had that day left her so disappointed of her childhood and all its happy memories, and of much that we will not refer to lest we anticipate our story. End of chapter 5 Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida The Sea Witch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon the Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Ballou Chapter 6 The Wreck About a fortnight subsequent to the period of the last chapter, Mrs. Huntington and her daughter, with a single attendant, found themselves embarked on board the Bengal, a large, well-found Indiaman, bound for Liverpool. The ship belonged to the East India Company, was a good carrier, but calculated more for freight than speed. She was a new ship and strong as iron and wood could be put together, and the widow and her child found their quarters on board of an exceedingly comfortable nature. They were the only passengers on board, but the vessel had a heavy freight list, and as she moved out from her anchorage to lay her course to sea, her draft of water was very deep. The Bengal fortunately encountered none but the most favorable winds and tides for many a long and to those on board somewhat monotonous days and the sun rose out of the sea clear and bright, and sunk again beneath its surface in gorgeous splendor with every diurnal rotation, until at length the ship touched at the Cape of Good Hope, where, having taken fresh water and provisions on board, she cleared direct for Liverpool. Every hour now seemed more especially to draw the ship nearer her port of destination, and a fresh spirit was infused among passengers and crew, in cabin and forecastle, but it was a long distance yet, and the widow and her daughter found time for much study and reading, for which they were amply supplied, and thus the time was lightened in its progress, and also well improved. But the ocean is a treacherous element, and the fair weather which had so long characterized their voyage was to be varied now by fierce and angry gales. It was the season of the year when they might expect this, and the captain had kept a sharp lookout. It was the middle of a fine afternoon that there was observed a singular phenomenon in the wind which appeared to come from half a dozen points at the same moment. The ship, of course, lost her steerage way, and the sea began most singularly to get up from all points in heavy cross waves. It was evident that they were either in the course of a whirlwind or close to its track, and every now and then gust came first larboard, then starboard, and again bows on and stern on with a force that snapped the rigging like pipe-stems, and tore the canvas from the bolt-ropes, notwithstanding the prompt orders and nimble efforts of the seamen, before it could be secured. Half an hour of this strange weather nearly stripped the ship of her standing rigging, leaving her comparatively a helpless wreck upon the waters, a mere log at the mercy of the wind and waves. The worst had not yet come, however, for the ship was sound still in her hull, and save that she was now wallowing in the trough of the sea, she was comparatively safe. She had sprung no leak, but her heavy freight tested her powers fearfully, and the captain was fain to acknowledge that there was not to be done but abide the raging of the storm until it was over. His attempt to rig a jury mast, on which to bend sail enough to give the ship steerage way, was perfectly fruitless. She rolled and pitched so fearfully that no effort of the kind could succeed but the crew were kept busy throwing over the heavier at tiles of freight to case the ship. As night came on with its intense darkness, relieved only by now and then a terrible flash of liquid fire, all on board expected each moment might be their last. Prayers were said, and all tried to compose their minds as far as possible to meet that death which seemed to be fast approaching them, when suddenly the cry ran, fore and aft, that the captain was lost overboard. This added to the general gloom, and now our cry was heard, There goes the flying Dutchman, as was seen by several on board the Indiaman, during the interval of the vivid lightning, a large ship dashed by them almost within cable's length, 
with a single topsail close reefed running before the gale with the speed of the wind. It did indeed look like a phantom craft. All was snug on board, not a soul was in sight, everything battened down, save one dark form apparently lashed to the wheel stanchions and steadily bent upon keeping the ship before the storm. It was a sight that added to the terror of those on board the Indiaman, and its effect was at once visible. The ignorant and superstitious seamen, ever ready to argue evil from any strange occurrence, now felt assured of their destruction, declaring that the strange appearance of the phantom ship was but a warning to foretell the fate that was preparing for them. Thus actuated, all discipline was gone, and no connected efforts were further made to protect the ship or render her in any degree safer from the power of the storm. To add still more to the critical condition on board, the ship, after straining and laboring so long, now began to leak and rapidly to fill. In this desperate state of affairs several of the crew, whose numbers were already thinned by being washed overboard, got into the spirit room, and in a condition of wild desperation became beastly intoxicated, resolving to die insensible to danger. And at intervals their crazy oaths and incoherent songs were heard above the gale. At this crisis, as is generally the case, two or three sterling spirits among the crew, and there is never a ship's company without some such among its members, one, the second mate, and a couple of foremast hands, came into the cabin and assured the widow and her daughter that they would protect them to the last, and that they were even now preparing the longboat with compass, water, and food, so that should the storm abate and the sea become less agitated before the ship should fill and go down, they might launch it, and with the ladies and such of them as desired, attempt to save themselves in this frail bark. With heartfelt gratitude, the mother and child accepted their protection and awaited the crisis, but not without solemnly kneeling together upon the cabin floor and committing themselves to the care of divine providence. The second mate of the Bengal was the only officer left, but he was a good sailor, a man of cool nerve and, and great personal strength. He now went calmly to work, sounded the well, and found four feet of water in the ship, made his calculations how long it would require for the ship to fill at the rate she then made water, and then set to work with his two companions to rig a triangle with spars above the longboat so as to lift and launch it just when the proper moment should arrive, but this he found to be impracticable. As the morning broke in the cast, the gale subsided, but the sea still kept up its angry commotion, though that too gradually subsided, the waves growing less and less, and the ship becoming more and more quiet, enabling those on board to keep at least upon their feet. In the meantime, the ship had gradually settled so that the water was already on the cabin floor. In vain were the entreaties of the mate and his companions for the four or five hands who had possessed themselves of the key of the spirit room to come on deck and save themselves. They could neither be persuaded nor forced to move, but lay in a state of beastly intoxication. Everything had been done that was possible to prepare for launching the longboat, and the widow and her daughter had already by the mate's sanction taken their seats within it, while one of the seamen secured and carefully stored the few articles of necessity which had been selected. The two masts of the boat were stepped and carefully secured. The gripes that secured the boat in its place were cut, leaving it standing upright in its wooden bed, but entirely free from the deck of the ship. Already had the ship sunk so low that all communication with the cabin was cut off, and the poor inebriated wretches who had there sought oblivion and intoxication also found their tomb. Food, water, and compass were properly disposed, so that any sudden movement of the boat should not dislodge them, oars and sails in readiness, and a careful examination had, lest some straggling rope might in some way connect the boat with the wreck, so as to draw them under when the floundering mass should at last go down. The crisis which they now expected seemed strangely protracted, and their fearful suspense was almost unbearable. The mate had placed one of his hands at the bows, another amidships, while himself and the two passengers occupied the stern, the precaution having also been taken to secure the ladies by ropes to the boat. 
the weather had now entirely moderated and the sea was comparatively calm except that now and then a heavy swell would lift the waterlogged craft and surge about the hull causing it to groan as though conscious of its approaching fate moments assumed the length of hours now and the countenance of each was a picture of agonized suspense and momentary expectation no one spoke above their breath again the heavy swell caused the hull to lurch and pitch until her bows were almost buried and the water was even with the scuppers the moment was approaching steady all said the mate calmly as he saw another approaching swell which he knew must cause the vessel to lift and settle again and probably this time proved the signal for her final plunge altogether steady i say and hold on to the boat stoutly now don't let go ladies for an instant the seaman was right the heavy hull was full as this surge came on burying her for an instant and actually sweeping the boat clear of her bulwarks out upon the sea a most fortunate circumstance which was instantly taken advantage of by pulling with the oars for a single instant and still further clearing the wreck which now rose high at the bows for a moment as the stern settled and gradually sunk causing a vortex which would certainly have engulfed the boat had it not been able thus to pull a short distance away and which even now drew it rapidly back to the spot where the ship had laid and causing it to toss fearfully for a while but in a few moments more all was quiet thank god that is over said the mate earnestly it was little short of a miracle that we did not all of us go down with the ship the widow covered her face with her hands and breathed a silent prayer of thankfulness it was already night again and steering by the stars the mate laid his course after affording a spare sail to cover the mother and her daughter who having partaken of some needed refreshment the first for many hours were soon lost in sleep induced by the great bodily fatigue and physical exertion they had so lately encountered in this emergency the men stood watch and watch relieving each other at intervals throughout the night while the boat with its two lugger sails crept on steadily upon its course it was remarkable to observe the delicacy observed by those three seamen towards the widow and her daughter to mark their assiduity towards them as to their necessities and their wants while they on their part were patient uncomplaining and grateful the second and third day passed on when the mate calculated they were steering direct for the nearest point of land which they could not fail to reach in another day it being the coast of africa his calculations were made under disadvantages but he felt confident of their correctness the weather fortunately had been very calm and pleasant thus far since the gale had subsided and the frail craft thus exposed upon the ocean had really proved quite comfortable and weatherly for the time being a snug little apology for a cabin had been constructed over the forward part of the boat into which the ladies could retire at nightfall and become secure from the weather and be entirely by themselves and under the circumstances they were really quite comfortable that is to say they experienced little exposure to the elements at night and slept securely in their narrow quarters in leaving the ship the mother had been more thoughtful than many persons would have been and had taken the box which contained her valuables and such papers as comprised her heavy bills of credit on england in which way she was transporting the bulk of her husband's late valuable estate to her native land at first she had taken especial pains not to have the fact known to the men that she had any great amount of valuables with her lest it should prove a temptation to them and lead to some tragical result as is regarded the safety of herself and child but she need not have feared those hardy sons of the ocean were true as steel and it was only the second day that having laid the casket down carelessly in the boat she had retired to the little forecastle, forgetting it when it was brought to her again by one of them who remarked that he presumed it was something of particular value by its appearance according to the mate's reckoning the time had already arrived when the land should heave in sight and the three seamen were constantly on the lookout for it in the supposed direction where it should appear but all their search for it proved in vain there was the same endless expanse of ocean before them day after day 
bounded only by the dim horizon and unrelieved by any object while the same hope reigned in their hearts the exposure they endured though not very severe yet began to tell upon them all and especially the maiden two seamen and the cheeks of the seamen already looked sunken their eyes less spirited this was the combined result of their feelings of disappointment with physical labor for they worked several hours at the oars every day aiding the sailing power of the boat in the hopes of reaching the land before another gale or storm should occur now however they began to discard the oars and to feel less and less courage to labor in propelling the boat the widow who was not a little of a philosopher and a woman of good sound mind determined to do something to amuse the men and cheer them up in their emergency she saw how sadly they needed some such influence and telling her daughter of her purpose when night again came on she induced her to sing some of her sweetest airs with all her power of execution and to repeat them to the real joy and delight of these hardy men who at once gathered an agency from this music and declared it was the harbinger of good whether it was so in the way they supposed or not it certainly was a harbinger of good as it regarded its cheering effects upon them and their hearts were again filled with hope and their sinews bent once more to toil at the oars end of chapter six recording by jerry dixon zephyr hills florida of the sea witch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon The Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Ballou Chapter 7 The Sea Witch While those sweet notes were being uttered under these peculiar circumstances, and the soft thrilling voice of the English girl floated over the sea, and the stars looked down coldly upon those wrecked adventurers, the mate who sat at the helm was observed to be peering in the boat's wake, as though looking for some coming object that would soon overtake them. Leaning over the boat's stern, he placed his cars as near the surface of the water as possible and listened. This he repeated several times with increased earnestness. Then, partially shading his eyes with his hands, he gazed back into the dim night air with intense interest, while the rest in the boat regarded him silently wondering what could be the import of his movements. Either there is a big fish in our wake, or I hear the ripple of a ship's cut water, but I cannot see hull or canvas in this darkness, said the mate, after a brief but searching gaze in the direction from whence they had come. It cannot be that you could hear the movement of a ship upon the water, farther than you could see her even in this light, said the mother. It may have been the hauling of a ship's yards, or some rickety block, but sound I did hear that came from on shipboard, said the mate with assurance. See, see, said the daughter at that moment, what is that? Pointing off nearly in the wake of the boat into the darkness. A ship, said the mate quickly, a ship as true as heaven, adding, shout, shout together now, or she will run us down. As he spoke, all eyes were bent on the dim object that was now fast approaching them, and steering as nearly on the same course with themselves as possible. Only a cloud of canvas was visible now, but soon the dark hull of a vessel appeared, and the mate hastened to light a lantern and hoist it to attract their attention. The signal was seemingly observed in an instant on board the stranger, and the hoarse deep order to heave the ship to rolled over the waters and rang a welcome sound in the ears of those in the boat i know not sort of what craft she is said the mate and this is a latitude where pirates intercept the homeward bound ships sometimes though according to my reckoning we are too well in for the land to be in that track i trust there is no danger in accepting the assistance that the ship appears willing to give said the mother anxiously to the mate it is not more dangerous than to pass another night in this open boat, madam, at all events, replied the mate frankly. Stand by to take this tow-line, shouted a voice from the bulwarks of the ship, 
as the vessel drifted with a side impetus towards the tiny craft, while the figure of a man was observed in the mizzen shrouds with a coil of line ready to heave at the word of command. Ay, ay, answered the mate, steering his boat so as to bring her side on to the ship, and opening his arms to catch the line, which he saw was about to be thrown. Heave! Heave clear of all! shouted a stern manly voice from the quarter-deck of the ship at this moment. Heave with a will! And a stout tow-line rattled through the air with a whizzing sound and lay between the mate's extended arms. This was instantly seized upon, and while one of the men took a turn about the stanchion in the bow of the boat, those on board the ship gathered in the line until the boat was safely moored under her quarter. No words were exchanged until the ladies first and the seamen next were taken on board, the fact of their being wrecked and in distress being too apparent to require questioning. The valuables in the boat were quickly transferred to the ship, and the little craft which had proved an ark of safety to the adventurers was then cut adrift, and soon lay a mere speck upon the waters, unguided and alone. As the boat drifted for a moment astern of the vessel, before the party were taken on board, the mate read her name on the stern in golden letters, the Sea Witch. The foremast hands who had been saved from the wreck soon mingled with the crew on the forecastle of the Sea Witch, and told their story there while the mate and the ladies were received in the most hospitable manner in the cabin, where the captain endeavored to offer them every comfort the ship afforded, and to place every resource entirely at their command. Mrs. Huntington and her daughter were at first too tearful and full of gratitude for their preservation to converse, and soon took advantage of the kind offer which placed the captain's private apartments entirely at their service, while the mate explained their adventures in detail not forgetting the phantom ship which passed them in the gale, and which had caused such consternation on board the wrecked Indiaman. But his story in this particular was unfortunately spoiled, when Captain Ratlin told him positively that he was at that moment on board the very craft which he had designated as the Flying Dutchman, a remark that for a moment puzzled the honest seaman and led him to look suspiciously about him. But a few corroborating remarks soon placed the subject at rest in even the mate's credulous mind. The fact was that the same gale which had made a wreck of the Indiaman had driven the sea witch two days sail or more out of her course, and had thus brought her inside of the bingle at that critical moment when it would have been impossible to have rendered her the least assistance. The continuance of the gale had carried the ship far to the southward, from whence she was now returning. It was early morning upon the day succeeding that auspicious night for the party in the boat, that Miss Huntington and her mother made their appearance upon the quarter-deck, and tendered their thanks for the service rendered. Captain Ratlin received them there with a frank manly air, assured them of full protection, and that he would land them at some port from whence they could take ship for England. A very few hours placed him on the best of terms with his passengers, for there was that frank and open discourse of manner with him, which his countenance promised, while he felt irresistibly drawn towards the gentle and beautiful girl, whose protector he had thus strangely and suddenly become. Not one point of her sweet beauty was lost upon the young commander, and her every word and movement he seemed to dwell upon and to consider with a tenacious degree of interest. On her part, Miss Huntington looked upon him as her preserver, and did not hesitate to accord him that confidence which the circumstances of her situation would so naturally lead to, being delighted and entertained by the sketches he gave her of sea life, and wild adventure upon the ocean, elicited by her suggestion. The mother, too, was well pleased with the profound respect and polite attention which herself and daughter received from him, and accorded him that cordial countenance in his intercourse with her child, which placed him quite at ease. "'We have not even asked you, Captain Ratlin, what trade you are in,' said the mother, as they sat together, her daughter and the young commander, upon the quarter-deck beneath an awning which had been rigged for their comfort. Ahem, madame, hesitated the young officer. We are, that is, 
yes we are on a trading voyage to the coast just at the present time whether the mother saw that the subject was not one which was of an agreeable nature to him or otherwise she at once changed the subject and congenial themes were discussed to the delight of the daughter who dwelt with evident pleasure upon the manly tones of the captain's voice which seemed to have some secret charm upon her even her mother noticed this and seemed to regard her with sensitive watchfulness while the captain was near though there was no well-defined suspicion or fear in her mind is it customary for traders upon these seas to go so thoroughly armed captain ratlin asked the daughter one day after she had been shown about the decks at her own request where she had marked the heavy caliber of the gun amidship and its well as well as the neat and serviceable array of small arms within the entrance to the cabin it is a treacherous latitude lady and the strong arm often makes the right he answered again evasively as he called her attention to some distant object in the horizon while at the same moment there was shouted from aloft land o oh! land land repeated the gentle being by his side what land africa quietly responded the captain without a token of satisfaction africa that is indeed an inhospitable shore can we land there yes i shall make sure that you land safely and can dispatch you to sierra leone from whence you can take ship for england but sail o shouted the lookout where away asked the captain promptly seizing a deck trumpet and abruptly turning from her to whom he had been speaking while his whole manner changed at once a couple of points on the larboard beam sir answered the seaman all hands mr faulkner and bout ship that square rig and the heavy lift of those topsails tell what there must be below to sustain them lively sir the sea witch must show her qualities miss huntington had watched with some amazement these orders and the result of the same and as she saw the beautiful craft in which she was put at once on the opposite tack and steer boldly away from the shore which had just been made she could not help for a moment remembering the words of the maid in the boat that pirates sometimes were found in these latitudes after a moment's thought she felt that she did captain ratlin injustice for whatever might cause him to flee from the sight of what she presumed by his remarks to be a man of war yet she felt that he could not be a pirate true the vessel even to her inexperienced eye was very strongly manned and there was a severity of discipline observed on board that was very different from that she had seen while they were in the indiaman but that man could not be a pirate she felt that he could not she would not do him the injustice to think it possible let the stranger be whom he might the sea witch seemed to have no intention of making his acquaintance and as easily dropped the top sails of the vessel again as she had made them, while from the manner in which the stranger steered, it was doubtful whether his lookout had made out the sea witch at all. And so Captain Ratlin remarked to his first officer, while he ordered the ship to be kept on her present course for an hour, then to haul up on the wind and run in shore again. "'Is it usual, Captain Ratlin?' asked the young and beautiful girl. "'For vessels on the coast to so dread meeting each other?' as to deliberately alter their courses when this seems likely to be the case trade is peculiar on this coast and men of warsmen take extraordinary liberties on board such vessels as they happen to overhaul was the reply i always avoid their company when i can do so conveniently as captain ratlin said this his eyes met those of his companion for a moment which were bent anxiously upon his face as though she would read his inmost thoughts he noted the expression, and replied at once, Whatever suspicion or fear may have entered Miss Huntington's mind, I beg of her to dispel, as it regards her own and her mother's safety and comfort. Both shall be my sole care until you are safely landed upon shore, where I shall at the earliest moment place you in a situation to reach your homes in England. I know you will do this, she replied, and if my looks betrayed any anxiety, it was not for our safety— but for your own captain ratlin my safety lady do you then consider that worth your anxiety he asked with unmistakable earnestness in his voice you have been more kind to us sir she continued 
You have been preserver, protector, and friend, and it were strange if I did not feel an interest for your welfare. This she uttered so ingeniously, so frankly, that it seemed not in the least indelicate or forward, while it thrilled the young commander's heart. Lady, since the moment you came on board, and I heard the tones of your voice, a strange interest sprang up in my heart, an indescribable one, and now that you express an interest in a poor wanderer's fate, you attach to it a value that he himself has never regarded it as possessing. But I read your suspicions, you have feared the worst, your looks have betrayed it, and you are ready to believe that I am a... Pirate, almost groaned his companion. You are not, pray say you are not. Not so bad as that, lady. But you are then... A slaver, said the young commander, turning from her and moodily walking the deck with a contracted brow and uneven step. End of chapter 7 Recorded by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida Aid of the Sea Witch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon The Sea Witch by Murray Maturin Ballou Chapter 8 The Quadroon For several days, succeeding that upon which Captain Ratlin had avowed himself to his fair young companion to be engaged in the slave trade upon the coast of Africa, the Sea Witch was occupied in running in towards the land and exchanging signals with friends on shore, and then standing off and on to watch a favorable moment for running to an anchorage, without encountering one of the English or American cruisers stationed on the coast. During this time, the young commander and his fair passenger found much time for conversation, and she strove with all that power of persuasion and delicacy of tact peculiar to her sex, to point out to the adventurous and generous-hearted commander the fearful responsibility of the course he was pursuing. Perhaps no other agent would have accomplished so much as she did. Indeed, no other could for a moment have gained his ear, and the result even to herself was very apparent, very satisfactory. He, all unconsciously yielded every argument to her, was only too ready and willing to grant her the fullest accordance in what she asked or argued, for though he dared not to say so, Yet he felt that already he loved the mild yet eloquent and lovely girl, with the devotion that caused all other interests to fade in importance. It was a novel idea to him to realize that so fair and gentle a creature could entertain such sufficient interest in him, a rough sailor, to strive and mold his conduct for good. On her part, it would be difficult for us to define the exact state of feelings which actuated the beautiful girl whom we first introduced to the reader in India. She felt an interest in the commander of the slaver that she was afraid to acknowledge not only to her mother, but indeed to herself. The tones of his voice came over her heart like the memory of music that we have heard at some distant time, and in some forgotten place. His eyes betrayed to her the love he dared not speak, and when she did pause to consider their relation towards each other, she half shuddered, and said to herself, Would to heave this man was a poor mechanic, anything but a slaver. How can I give my confidence to him, and yet how can I withhold it? For he wins from me my very thoughts. One evening, just after sunset, Miss Huntington and her mother had been tarrying on the quarter-deck for a long while, watching the conversation going on between the ship and shore by means of flags, and observing that the sea witch had run in closer than usual, the mother asked, "'Shall we not land before long, Captain Ratlin? We have been in the vicinity of the shore so long that I begin to feel quite impatient.' "'Tonight, madam, we shall be on shore. I cannot offer you very good quarters at first, but you shall find conveyance to Sierra Leone shortly, from whence you can sail for England.' "'We have to thank you for much kindness, sir,' she continued gratefully. "'Nay, madame, necessity and duty to my owners has rendered it imperative for me to approach the coast cautiously, and hence a delay I could not avoid. 
"'You are too honest and manly a spirit, sir,' said the mother frankly, "'to be engaged in such a trade. "'Ah, sir, why not turn your talents to a more fitting purpose? "'The field of commerce is extensive, and such as you need not look for command. "'Madame, your daughter has already caused me to behold my position "'in a very different light from what I did when I cleared my ship from the last port. "'I rejoice, Captain Ratlin, to hear you say so.' was the frank rejoinder of the mother, as she extended her hand to him, and what she pressed respectfully. She is thus frank and open with me, reasoned the young commander to himself, because she has no reason for restraint. But were I to tell her that I loved her child, that she was already so dear to me that I would relinquish all things for her, that face, so friendly in its expressions now, would be suffused with disdain and scorn. No, no, such a fate is not in store for me. A sailor should know but one mistress, and she should be a ship. But the heart is a stubborn thing. I would not have believed that such a change could come over me. Stand by to let go the starboard bow anchor, he shouted, as the vessel gradually crept shoreward with the oncoming of night, and assumed the position in which he desired to place her. Her sails were gradually furled, and as she drew to her anchorage ground, a quarter-boat was lowered from the davits, while the chain cable rang its loud report as it ran out at the hawser hull, and the ship swung gradually with the set of the current, leaving her stern towards the shore. But a few moments elapsed before Captain Ratlin and his two passengers, with such articles as they had brought on board, were skimming over the short space between the ship and the shore propelled by a half-dozen stout rowers. It had already been explained to them that at first it would be necessary to land them and offer them shelter at Don Leonardo's slave factory until a mode of conveyance could be procured for them to reach Sierra Leone. So they were not surprised, but placing full confidence in Captain Ratlin, were satisfied. At the house of Don Leonardo, they were hospitably received, and found the proprietor to be a rough Spaniard, with a dark quadroon daughter, whose mulatto mother was dead. The household, though primitive in many particulars, was yet profusely supplied with every necessity, and even many luxuries. In the rear of the house was a spacious barracoon, where the slaves were collected and kept for shipment, and where they were plentifully supplied with rice and vegetables, with salt meats, and the means of doing their own cooking. All these things the newcomers noted at once, and indeed were very curious and fully understanding. There seemed to be little restraint exercised about the place. The slaves were looked at in the light of prisoners of war, and did not attempt escape. They seemed to be quite indifferent themselves as to their fate, and were very happy, with good food to eat and plenty of it. One thing that both Mrs. Huntington and her daughter marked well was the fact that Don Leonardo, greeted Captain Ratlin as one whom he had met before, and that Maud, his daughter, also sprang forward to meet him with unmistakable tokens of delight. On his part, both were cordially greeted, and they spoke together like people whose time was precious and whose business required despatch. Mrs. Huntington gathered enough from their open and undisguised talk to learn that as there was not a sufficient number of Negroes at the present moment on hand, that the sea witch with her light draught of water, must be run up a neighboring river and be there moored away from the prying eyes of the cruisers on the coast, until the proper hour should arrive for shipping her freight. Therefore, when Captain Ratlin left them, it was with a promise to return and join them again within a few hours. He resolved to moor his vessel under the shelter of the present favoring darkness, to which end he at once repaired on board. The two English ladies, both mother and daughter, found much to interest them in Maud Leonardo. She seemed to be a strange girl, a rough diamond, with all the tact and ready invention of her mulatto mother, and all the fire of her Spanish father. They soon learned that this was not Captain Ratlin's first visit to the coast, and that her father, as well as herself, considered him the finest seaman and gentleman in the coast trade. It was impossible not to see with what feeling Maud the Quadroon dwelt upon the good qualities of him she referred to, declaring that he was a father to all the people he took away in his ship, 
and how kind he was to them, that he always knocked off their shackles at once, and made friends of them by real kindness. Mrs. Huntington, to say nothing of her daughter, saw something more than mere honest admiration in the enthusiastic girl's remarks about the young commander, and the mother shrewdly determined to question her upon the theme, and to weigh well her answers. "'Captain Rutland is very friendly to you, I suppose, Maud,' said Mrs. Huntington. "'He is friendly to father, and that is the same thing,' she replied simply. "'Has he not brought your presence across the ocean?' continued the mother. One, said Maud, with evident pleasure, rolling back a long sleeve, and discovering to her new-made friends a rich golden bracelet, set with pearls, a rare and beautiful ornament. This is indeed beautiful, said the mother. Mrs. Huntington examined the jewel, while her daughter turned thoughtfully away. She could not be mistaken. She saw at once that this rude, uncultivated girl loved the commander of the Sea Witch, nor did she wonder at such a fact but yet she found herself musing and asking within her own mind whether such a being could make him happy as a wife. She felt that he was worthy of better companionship, and that, notwithstanding Maud evidently loved him, he could hardly entertain any peculiar regard for her. Could he have deceived the girl, she thought? No, deceit was no part of his nature. That she felt sure of, and thus she mused alone to herself placing the relationship of the two in all manner of lights, until she saw him again. Having moored the sea witch safely amid the jungle of one of the many winding rivers that indent the coast of Africa, and sent down her upper spars to prevent her from being discovered by any exhibition of the top hamper above the trees and jungle growth, Captain Ratlin left his crew under charge of the first officer, Mr. Faulkner, and returned once more to the seaboard in the establishment of Don Leonardo. Here it would be necessary for him to remain for a week or more, while the Spaniard sent his runners inland to the chiefs of the various coast tribes to forward the prisoners of war to his barracoons. This period of time was passed in various domestic amusements, in observing the sports and games of the natives, their habits, and studying their nationalities, for the slaves in Don Leonardo's barracoons represented a score of different tribes, each characteristic of its origin. Mrs. Huntington regarded Captain Ratlin's intercourse with Maud with much interest, which she did not attempt to disguise, while her daughter did so under the disguise of indifference, but with the most intense interest. Not a word, look, or sign between them betrayed the least token of any understanding or peculiar confidence as existing between the commander and the quadroon. Maud, on her part, began to change somewhat since the first day of the arrival of the strangers. Then she was as free and unconstrained as innocence itself. Now she seemed to regard the newcomers with a jealous eye, for she saw the deep feeling evinced by the young commander towards the fairest of the two. She heard a strange charm in the tone of his voice when he addressed the daughter and at such moments Mrs. Huntington more than once saw her bosom heave quickly, and her eye flash with a wild and startling fire that made her tremble. This was jealousy, plain and unmistakable, a fact that no woman would have been at a loss to understand. It was not possible that the mother should be blind to the feeling evinced by Captain Ratlin towards her daughter, and she thought, so long as this sentiment maintained the respectful and solicitous character which it now bore, that it would redound to their security and future safety, as they were in one sense completely in his power. But as it regarded the idea of her daughter's entertaining any affection for him, or seriously considering his advances, the idea could not for a moment enter her head. She did not at all consider that there was any danger of her daughter's losing her heart. No, no. Had not she been accustomed to attention from earliest girlhood, and from the most polished men, she did not even think it necessary to speak to her upon the subject. She might be as friendly as she pleased with him under the circumstances. But the daughter herself, who to her mother's eye was so indifferent, was at heart deeply and strangely impressed by the frank, chivalrous, and devoted attention of the commander of the slaver. His attention was characterized by the most unquestioned delicacy and consideration. 
he had never uttered the first syllable to her that he might not properly have used before her mother indeed he had not the boldness or effrontery to urge a suit that he knew was out of the question and yet he felt irresistibly drawn towards the english girl and could not disguise from her the true sentiments that so plainly filled his inmost heart she must have been less than woman not to have read his very soul so bared to her scrutiny it was the first time that she had ever deceived her mother because it was the first time that she had loved yes loved for though she would as soon have sacrificed her life as to have acknowledged it yet she did love him and the poor untutored quadroon girl read the fact that the mother could not with all her cultivation and knowledge of the world detect but jealousy is an apt teacher and the spirit of maud leonardo was now thoroughly aroused she sighed for revenge and puzzled her brain how she might gain the longed-for end captain ratlin had eyes for only one object and that was the young and beautiful english girl he never gave a thought to maud he had never done so for one moment as a friend of her father or rather as a dealer intimately connected in a business point of view with him he had given a present to his daughter and had endeavored to make himself agreeable to her at all times but never for one moment with a serious thought of any degree of intimacy save of the most public and ordinary character probably maud herself would have never thought seriously about the matter had she not felt how much the english girl suppressed her in beauty in accomplishment and in all that might attract the interest of one like captain ratlin jealousy is a subtle poison and the quadroon was feeding upon it greedily while its baleful effect was daily becoming more and more manifest in her behavior end of chapter eight recording by jerry dixon zephyr hills florida of the sea witch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon The Sea Witch by Murray Macherin Ballou Chapter 9 The Attack Don Leonardo was no favorite among the tribes and chiefs of the region which was his immediate neighborhood, and he lived within the walls of his well-arranged residence, more like one in a fort than in his own domestic dwelling maintaining himself in fact by a regular armament of his servants and a few countrymen whom he retained in his service with the negroes he was therefore no friend save so far as he purchased their prisoners of them whom they secured in their marauding inroads upon the interior tribes they feared don leonardo because he was a bold bad man and cared not for the spilling of blood at any time for the furtherance of his immediate gain in the trade he pursued it was for his interest to make them fear him, and this he contrived to do most effectually. As Don Leonardo always paid for the slaves he purchased of the coast tribes in hard Spanish dollars, they believed him to possess an inexhaustible supply of specie, and the idea of robbing him had more than once been broached among them in their councils. But fear and want of tact as to proper management in conducting an assault they felt would ensure the defeat of such a purpose and thus the spaniard had remained unmolested for years in his present position but in no way relaxing the necessary degree of vigilance which should render safe his household for he knew full well the treacherous character of the negroes and that they were not for a moment to be trusted maud his daughter was in no way ignorant of this state of affairs she fully understood the entire matter perhaps the fact that some portion of the blood of that despised race ran in her own veins led her to conceive a plan for revenge which should embrace not only the party who was the grave object of her hate but even every person of white blood in her father's household not even excepting her father no one save a north american indian can hold and nourish a spirit of revenge like a quadroon it seems to be an innate trait of their nature and ever ready to burst forth in a blaze at any moment it was impossible to understand exactly by what course of reasoning maud had arrived at the purpose of attempting the destruction of the household as she did 
one would have supposed that she would have been apt to adopt the easiest mode of arriving at the desired result, and that with even her simple knowledge of poison, she might, with a little adroitness, have taken the lives of all who were gathered under her father's roof at a single meal. But the revengeful girl evidently had some secret feeling to gratify in the employment of the agents whom she engaged for her purpose, and the blow she resolved should be struck, and decisively, too, by the negro enemies of her father, who were his near neighbors. For this fell purpose Maud held secret meetings with the chiefs, represented that her father's strong boxes were full of gold and silver coin, and that the negroes had only to effect an entrance at night, means for which she was herself prepared to furnish them, and at the same time representing to them that they would have it in their power to revenge themselves for all their past wrongs at her father's hands, fancied or real. The negroes and their chiefs were only too intent upon the treasures their fancy depicted to think or care for Maud herself, or to question the reason of her unnatural treachery. So they promised to enter the stockade under her direction, rob the house, and then screen the deed they had committed by burning the dwelling and all within its precincts. While this diabolical plan had been thoroughly concocted, Captain Ratlin and the two English ladies had passed many pleasant hours together, all unconscious of there being any danger at hand, and even Maud, with subtle treachery, seemed more open and free than she had been in her intercourse with them at first. But when she thought herself unobserved, she would at times permit a reflex of her soul to steal over her dark, handsome features, and the fire of passion to flash from her eye. At such moments, the quadroon became completely unsexed, and could herself scarcely contain her own anger and passion so far as not to spring, tiger-like, upon the object of her hatred. But the hour for the attempt upon the dwelling, and the destruction of its inhabitants, drew near. The negroes had sworn to stand by each other, and had sacrificed an infant to their deity, to propitiate him and ensure success. It was long past midnight that the blacks might have been seen pouring out of the adjacent jungle, nearest to the house. They had selected the hour for their attack when they supposed the dwellers in the stockade house would be soundest wrapped in sleep, and they had indeed chosen well, and all their plans had been carefully arranged. But just as Maud opened the secret entrance for them to pass in, and she herself passed out, to flee for the time being from the scene, Don Leonardo came out from his sleeping apartment, followed by a trusty slave, and promptly shot down the two first figures that entered by the door, causing them to fall dead. This unexpected repulse caused those behind to retreat for a while to the jungle, where they might consult under cover as to what this unexpected opposition to their plans indicated. The reader may as well be here informed that a faithful slave, who had been long with the Spanish trader, and who had been confided in by the robbers, at last could not keep the secret, but just at the opportune moment aroused her master, while he, by his promptness, for the moment stayed the attack, until the door could once more be fastened, and the people awakened and armed to repel the congregated mass of the enemy. The father did not for one moment suspect his child's treachery, and was amazed and alarmed by her absence, but there was little time for speculations upon that or any other matter, since the large numbers of the negroes had rendered them bold, and they seemed determined, now they were partially foiled in their purpose as to entering the place by stratagem, to carry the house at all hazards by actual storm, while they rendered the air heavy with their yells. Don Leonardo was not at all alarmed. He had fought too many battles with the negroes to fear them. He quietly prepared his firearms, and loaded to the muzzle a heavy swivel gun he kept mounted at one of the main windows, while he gave arms to such of his slaves as he felt confidence in, and to his immediate retainers. The negroes had never seen nor heard the swivel fired, as it was a late importation. They had become somewhat accustomed to small arms, and though they had a dread of them, yet it was not sufficient to deter them from making the attack after having congregated in such numbers, and having become so wrought up by each other. But as they made a rush bodily towards the stockade, Don Leonardo filled the swivel, which had been loaded with shot, slugs, and bullets, into their very midst, 
every missile telling on the limb or body of one or more. The effect was electrical, and the slaughter large. The astonished savages rapidly gathered up their wounded companions and returned to the jungle once more. At first this terrible slaughter among them seemed to deter them from the idea of a second attack, but the loud report of the gun rapidly augmented the numbers of the blacks until they made a second onslaught with almost precisely the same effect. They could scale the stockade only on this side, while on the other, or opposite side, Captain Ratlin kept up such a deadly and accurate fire of musketry that everyone who approached the buildings was sure to forfeit his life. It was fortunate that this arrangement had been made, for the Negroes twice attempted to set the dwellings on fire from the rear, but were instantly repulsed by Captain Ratlin's double-barreled gun, which was ready loaded by his side, and which he used with fearful accuracy of aim on every approaching object. The Negroes seemed to be wrought up to such a state of excitement that they would not give over their purpose, though it involved such immense risk and sacrifice of life, and the attack was continued at intervals far into the morning and long after the regular course of duty, until at last the Negroes divided their mutilated numbers into four parties, and it was evidently their last and most determined attempt. They did not hurry this but seemed to pause and take refreshments and rest for a couple of hours, when once more the onslaught commenced, and the inhabitants of the stockade found it a desperate fight, and one even of doubtful result if long continued as it began. "'Keep the black imps clear, Don, for a short half-hour longer, and it will be all up with them,' shouted Captain Ratlin from the rear. "'I see a heavy square rig rounding the point and standing in for an anchorage,' We shall find civilized help. That is lucky, growled the Spaniard, as he coolly shot down a negro. Our powder is fast giving out. The inhabitants of the stockade sadly needed assistance at this critical juncture, for the infuriated savages had become desperate and reckless in their attack, and must soon have carried the building by storm. But there soon pulled to the beach a half-dozen boats, with a detachment of marines and seamen, led on at full speed by an officer, before whose approach the angry negroes retired exhausted, leaving many dead upon the ground, and many too severely wounded to effect their retreat to the jungle. The fight had been a very sanguinary one to the half-witted creatures outside the stockade. The newcomers were an officer and part of the crew of a man-of-war that was cruising upon the coast, and which had been attracted to the harbor by the firing of the heavy swivel. They were admitted within the stockade. That they were English was at once observable by the flag that floated from the graceful craft that had now rounded to and come to an anchor within blank cartridge shot of the factory or barracoons. The officer felt authorized to interfere, as we have seen, but his power of search and of interference in the peculiar trade of the coast ceased the moment he touched the land. His jurisdiction did not extend over any residence on their property, unless it was afloat. Over the coast and rivers he claimed jurisdiction only. The newcomers were hospitably entertained by Don Leonardo, while the officer who had led them, and whose insignia of rank betrayed his station as captain, was introduced into the more private apartments of the place, where were the ladies and Captain Ratlin, the latter trying to reassure them and to quiet their fears on account of the late fearful business of the fight. He was thus engaged when the English captain entered, and was not a little astonished to hear the mutual expressions of surprise that were uttered by both the ladies and the officer himself, while a moment sufficed to show them to be old acquaintances. The reader would here recognize, in the newcomer, Captain Robert Bramble, whom we saw paying suit to Miss Huntington not long previous on the shady veranda of her mother's house in the environs of Calcutta. Notwithstanding the excitement of the moment, and the joy felt on all sides at the timely arrival of the English officer and his people, notwithstanding the surprise of the moment that filled all present at the singular melting of old friends under such extraordinary circumstances, yet a close observer might have noticed an ill-suppressed expression of dissatisfaction upon Captain Ratlin's face, as he saw the English captain in friendly and even familiar intercourse with mother and daughter. 
who could have possibly foreseen this strange this opportune meeting said the mother it is as strange as agreeable i assure you replied the newcomer and you were wrecked and picked up at sea you say and brought here by captain ratlin interrupted the daughter fearing that her mother would have introduced a word that would have betrayed their protector yes by captain ratlin continued the mother permit me to introduce you gentlemen captain bramble this is captain ratlin you are both seamen and there is no need of compliments though i am seriously indebted to you both of the merchant service i presume said the english officer regarding the young and handsome commander of the sea witch with a somewhat suspicious eye from childhood was the cool reply while as though by a feeling of common content both turned away from each other to other objects captain bramble saw that she whom he had so profitlessly saved she whose smile would have been invaluable to him now spoke low and gently to the merchant captain and even smiled kindly upon his remarks to her of whatever nature they might be doubtless from the moment of their introduction a vague suspicion of his true character crossed the english officer's thoughts but now he needed no other incentive than the fact that miss huntington received and entertained his address so agreeably and with such evident pleasure to make him more than watchful and resolved to find out the truth you are not long arrived captain ratlin asked the other within these two weeks was the calm reply not seeing your vessel i presume she has gone to the windward for ivory or perhaps to leeward for other cargo answered the other somewhat haughtily the hint was sufficient and the english officer saw that let his trade be what it might he had one to deal with who was master of his own business and who feared no one it was nearly night when maud leonardo repaired expressing profound surprise at what had occurred and feigning well-assumed grief and regret so honestly too as to deceive all parties who observed her but her secret chagrin could hardly be expressed indeed her father who knew her better than any one else saw that there was something wrong in his daughter's spirit that some event had seriously annoyed and moved her he knew the child possessed of much of her mother's wild revengeful disposition and though even he never for a moment suspected her unnatural treachery yet he resolved to watch her the negroes she had joined in the attack were completely routed and disheartened and fearing the power and cunning of don leonardo retreated far inland and incorporated themselves with the tribes that gather their wild and precarious living in the depths of the jungle End of chapter 9 Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida